Just want to welcome everybody again to the uh, climate uh, embracing climate truth and rising up in action webinar. Um, there's a lot going on in the planet right now. There's a lot going on in our own lives. I know I feel a lot of grief, and we're going to touch on how we manage, how we support each other, how we support ourselves in this time, and, and the grief that comes up as we, you know, handle the global situation. Um, so. Without further ado, I want to um, give you a sense about um, how the evening is going to go tonight and about our presenters. Uh, so we are going to spend about an hour talking about climate science, about climate uh, silence, excuse me, about climate truth, um, about um, how to how to handle the news and and what does it mean. Um, then we're going to spend some time, you know, really addressing the climate dr the grief side of things. And I, I know, like for myself, like sometimes I feel a little paralyzed um, about what I can do because the issue seems so big. Um, but we, but we're all so tied into what's happening right now. Um, and so, how do we handle that? Um, then we're going to get into solutions. We're going to talk about models that are taking place at local governance levels, community building models, actions that you can take, uh, and and specifically what we can do here. Just in the next month, there's a climate strike. There's climate climate events, and a lot of ways that we can engage in, and build community together. So I'm happy to have you all on. If you're just coming on, again, let us know uh, where you're coming in from um, there in the chat. And um, I want to introduce our, I want to introduce our, um, our guest today. Um, so, uh, so joined with us today is Trayton Heckman. He's the executive director of Daily Axe Organization. Um, he serves on the board of Transition US and the California Water Efficiency Partnership and is an advisory board member of NorCal Community Resilience Network. Trayton helps people and groups reclaim the power of their actions uh, to regenerate self, nature, and community. Uh, he lives in the Petaluma River watershed where he grows food, medicine, and wonder while working to compost apathy and lack. And Trayton is a, a, a longtime friend of mine. I'm Eric Olson. I'm the director of the Permaculture Skills Center. Uh, Trayton has been a huge inspiration to myself and thousands of other people uh, to uh, on how we can really take action on a multitude of different levels. We are so blessed to have him here today. Um, and we also have Nicole Warwick with us. She's also works with Daily Acts. She's a mother, a psychologist, and an educator who's building on her diverse background to create a healthy and sustainable schools in Sonoma County. She works collaboratively with Dave, Daily Acts and the Jonas Fund as the environmental health innovator researching the impacts of environmental toxins on children's health and collaborating with experts in the field to support healthier and more sustainable schools in Sonoma County. So we are uh, so grateful to have you both on um, and uh, welcome Trayton and, uh, and Nicole. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Great to be with you both. So, um, so Trayton, uh, why don't you uh, help us contextualize the, the the situation that we find ourselves in. Sure. Uh, before I do that, Nicole's going to do some practice with us, but I tend to like to breathe and to, to, to breathe together is actually means to conspire and it's an important thing to do. And so before we do that, we do a lot of mind body medicine practices that Nicole's going to touch on and just want to acknowledge that these aren't for everyone and so if you just want to take a moment of silence, or if you do want to do a brief meditation, you could close or lower your eyes, do whatever works best for you. Um, but those who do want to do a little meditation, we'll just take a moment and you could close or lower your eyes, put your feet flat on the ground, assuming you're not driving a vehicle or something, you know, that you're in a safe and stable place and just land for a second and just check in with your body and just take a nice few slow breaths. In through your nose and let your body gently relax. And then just see if there's something that could come to your heart and mind that gives you a sense of gratitude. Someone or something that you're grateful for. And just let that sit in your heart for a moment. Good. 
Then go ahead and open your eyes or raise them and give a little shake. It's always good to get present in our body. And I want to steal any of Nicole's thunder on the piece that's coming up, but it always helps me to kind of pause and breathe and ground, especially since there is just a ton going on in our world and life. It's the, the days are kind of astounding me. Um, so anyways, so for the flow overall, like Eric touched on, this is kind of a really big, urgent, and for many people, an absolutely overwhelming talk it, topic, and one that we're not actually talking a lot about. And unless we start talking about it, regardless of whether we're an expert or we're just an everyday person or a parent, um, one of the core things we need to do is start getting educated and start talking with other people. That's really important. And so, you know, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not even a climate expert. I do have almost two decades experience running nonprofits and being an educator um, and doing permaculture and things like that. But I also want to say that we shouldn't have to be experts. There's plenty of expertise out there now. The case is really clear. So I'm not going to drop too much into the science, maybe just bring a few pieces of framing that people may know or they may have not heard yet in climate regard. Um, and then we're going to, um, Nicole's going to work with us a bit on, because one thing, like I haven't done a lot of grief work personally, I've always appreciated it, but getting the reality of our reality. I've woken up for a while. We do a lot of mind body medicine practice, but the recognition that we really need to um, be able to work effectively with what we're experiencing and to fully have the experience so we can let it in and change us in a way will that have the best impact. Um, and then from there, we're going to dive in, you know, talk a little bit about some of the things going on globally and nationally, and then just share some of what's emerging really rapidly in Sonoma County. Um, a lot of different exciting things emerging. And so just have a reference for that. Um, and then share some ways that you all could take action, whether you're in Sonoma County or wherever you are. So that's the overall flow of things. And three things we're going to kind of touch on in this too are really like three key issues I'm looking at are silence, despair, and denial. A Yale study recently reported that about 70% of people in the U.S. care about climate change, but only 30% of us are talking about it. And those numbers are even going up rapidly. I know I saw a study recently that said in the U.K. it's around 85% of people are really concerned. Things are shifting very quickly. Um, whether you're feeling it or seeing it, Kaiser's writing about it, it's everywhere. Climate and eco despair and anxiety are just skyrocketing. It's a major issue. And there's this both overt and a stealth form of denial that I myself has pra have practiced, even doing climate work, where um, you know, we'll, we'll, ignore, we'll, si we'll have a conversation, we'll sigh and acknowledge, and then we go back to business as usual. We go back to planning the vacation we're planning, eating the meal we're going to eat, and doing the things we're going to do. And this is from everyday people to high-level leaders that I speak with. Um, and so those are a few things that I hope we can address. And one of the frames, you know, Daily Acts, for, we're an educational nonprofit, and we've been really focused since our beginning on helping people be the change um, you know, to really create more healthy and just resilient communities and teaching people the basics of how do you grow food, how do you use your rainwater, how do you use your gray water, everything from these home scale solutions to partnering with cities and agencies and businesses and doing wide scale mobilizations. I've done a lot of landscape transformations with Eric installing public food forests and things like that. Um, and so we, you know, oftentimes for 18 years, we kind of been maybe waving the ocean bell like 10%. And then, but focused on solutions, focused on the power solutions, because that's where our juice is and that's how we be the change. And in the last year or so of really dropping in deeply just to the brutal reality of where we're at and the herd of it, of recognizing, you know, we may need to change how we're communicating about these things. And a key reference for me in this is a woman named Margaret Klein Solomon, and she founded the climate mobilization movement, an organization that has helped launch a movement. And she's a, um, you know, a late 20s PhD psychologist, and she really looks at, and she wrote an incredible article, and it's a long read, but it's called Embracing Climate Truth, or it's called, uh, the title may have just been Climate Truth, but it really looks at, you know, the reason she started her organization, because she was looking out and seeing a lot of organizations, even scientists, weren't actually telling the full truth of how urgent things are, and that really led her to um, want to take a different approach. And if you think about a lot of what is working these days in the global youth movement with Greta Thunberg and people, they are just speaking this absolutely fierce and courageous truth. And it's having a really powerful impact. Uh, and so in this regard, I'm just going to, you know, quote a few words from Margaret 
on the transformative power of climate truth. She says, only a truth-focused strategy holds the potential for societal transformation on the massive scale that is necessary to protect humanity in the natural world. Um, and it's really looking at a, you know, a 10-year mobilization plan to get to zero carbon while practicing drawdown and sequestration and deep adaptation as well. It's really a lot of people use the framing that I'm sure some of you have heard around sort of like a World War II mobilization where our country just turned on a dime and went into war mode. We need the version of that for health, safety, and peace. Um, and so that's a little bit of, you know, the frame. Not going to spend a lot of time on the state of the science in that, but like I said, there's a couple things that I, I do want to point out in that regard. And so just in Sonoma County where we live, in the last six-ish years, we've had record floods, record droughts, and record fires. Um, and then as many people know, two years ago when we had our, our record fires, they're just absolutely devastating. Um, a positive side is the community came together in a way I've never seen people come together. And then right after that, there were more record fires in Santa Rosa and then record mudslides. And then the next fall, this last year, it was the campfires. And then we get the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which is basically, um, and scientists don't usually use really extreme language, but using words like civilization collapse and that we have to keep um, under 1.5 degrees Celsius, basically reducing emissions to around 45% in the next decade. Um, and so you think, uh, wow, that's really extreme and big by itself, but that means actually peaking emissions right now. So we have to be making major leaps immediately. That's not like, oh, we have a few years or a decade to work it out. Uh, and they just released another report on land-based issues. And so, you know, the Amazon's on fire and we have record ice melt. And I think we all see it in the news, just this overwhelming news that is just increasingly coming in every day. Every month seems like a new temperature record. Uh, and so things have been escalating for a while. And in the last couple of years with the records of hurricanes, fires, floods, droughts, um, you know, we're getting a really big wake up call from our earth that is just pretty much in the news every single day, just about. And at the same time, we're getting these more um, alarming reports. And so rel is, as, as kind of, you know, in, in the speaking climate truth piece, as um, urgent as reducing global emissions 45% in a decade is, I want to read a little bit from Jose Javier Hernandez Ayala, and he's the director of Climate Research Center at Sonoma State University. And what him and other scientists are pointing out is, again, that a decade, we actually have to start drawing down and reducing emissions immediately. And, and what he says in there is as dire as that report sounds, there's actually zero emissions left to contribute. There's not a decade to reduce 45% emissions because that report is a, is a middle scenario. And what we've consistently heard from scientists, you probably have read it in reports too, for the last decade plus is, wow, worse than expected. I just read an article about a month ago where we lost 12.5 billion tons of ice from the Greenland ice sheet, I believe, in a day. And that was a big record. And according to one scientist, that was um, at the most pessimistic scenario for 2070. So things like that ice melt, uh, according to Dr. Ha Jose Javier Hernandez, aren't actually factored into the IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel of Clim Climate Change reports. So there's, um, it's actually a, you know, a much more severe scenario than is even painted and seems pretty extreme. And, you know, as Bill, you know, I'm going to quote Bill McKibben and Greta Thunberg, two incredible climate movement heroes. And similarly, you know, when I read this in an interview that McKibben did a while back, I was sort of even taken aback because it takes a while to break through the layers of denial and to really embrace reality. And he said, we're not playing for stopping climate change. We're playing for maybe being able to slow it down to the point where it doesn't make civilization impossible. It's a big statement. If you've read his new book, Falter, really important medicine. I recommend reading it. Really difficult to read because there's just, it's, it's a lot, 200 pages of harsh realities. They're helping build a global movement, which is amazing. I want to hear more about that in his books, but, you know, I appreciate that he's telling the harsh truth. And then if you think about, so, you know, a year ago this month, a 15-year-old girl started cutting school on Fridays and went and stood in front of her parliament building to demand climate action, holding up a sign. 
And what's astounding about this, I'm only going to touch on this briefly, and then we're going to pass it off to Nicole, um, is that this spawned a global movement. Within months, over um, 1.6 million youth in 120 countries started doing climate strikes. And we'll talk about more climate strikes coming up. And I just want to cite something that she said in, um, in one of her presentations to um, you know, high-level politicians. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear, fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. And so Greta is someone that is speaking climate truth and it, it's piercing a lot of the denial and inaction and having a really powerful impact. And so it's amazing to me. I take huge inspiration and courage from this global youth movement and what they're doing. Um, but before we talk too much about those solutions, uh, a piece that we often skip over in our facts and our reports and the fires and the floods is just like, how are we emotionally processing this? Are we understanding it? Do we have the tools to relate with this in our body so we can, you know, like they say on a plane, put your own oxygen mask on before, before assisting others. Um, and so I'd like to pass it off to my good friend and super inspiring coworker, Nicole, who's going to just drop us in a bit of, around climate grief and distress and some practices that we can work with. Thank you, Trayton. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. Um, just for myself right now, after hearing everything that you said, um, I'm just tracking my body and I noticed that there was a change in my breathing and I'm feeling the need to just kind of quiet again and take inventory. And so I invite all of you to take a moment with me to just check in right now. How are you feeling? Take, take notice of your breathing. Bringing awareness to the air as it passes through your nose. Got a, just a, a little frozen there for one moment, just. Nicole, you still there? She's in a deep meditation, man. <laughs> yeah. Just keep breathing. Trayton, back to you for now. Sure. Yeah, until we get Nicole back of, and. And this is, like she said, for when we're taking this in, when we read articles or hear people speak, and if we're going to start actually speaking climate truth, I, I feel it myself. It's, it's hard to process and actually speak this. Um, and so just being able to get present in our body and in our breath, um, you know, so one of the things that hopefully I won't take from Nicole coming on, but is, you know, we have, a, we have two, two parts of our nervous system, our, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. And when we practice mind body practices that she's going to talk about, like meditation, that brings us into our parasympathetic nervous system, which gets us out of fight or flight. And if you think about like, even going to the space that I was just going to touch on. All right, I'm back. Oh, she's back. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. I was just starting to mention about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, so I will pause. <laughs> well, I don't Repetitional know missed, and I don't know how much you heard, but if we're just still checking in with our bodies and just acknowledging that that's a lot to sit with. Yeah. It's a lot to process. And whatever the emotions are that's coming up, it's okay because all feelings are welcome. And it, being able to acknowledge the feelings that we're having about this with compassion for ourselves and it really is kind of a balm during this time. It is quite medicinal. Um, if you're able to, I invite you to bring your hands together like a butterfly, like this. Place them on your chest with your fingers right below your collarbone. In Chinese medicine, they refer to this area as the sea of ability. So what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate a relaxation response for our nervous system by just fluttering the fingers in a bilateral tapping motion. gently back and forth, side to side. Just that alternate tapping can help us tap into that autonomic nervous system that you had mentioned. It helps us 
engage a relaxation response. So these simple activities, breathing, tuning into our bodies, listening, tapping, can stimulate a relaxation response within the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's going to help us. Because as the climate changes, we will undoubtedly experience more stress and more trauma. So these evidence-based mind-body medicine skills will help us better understand our own unique stress responses, what triggers us, how we can better regulate ourselves, and how we can, can care for ourselves and also compassionately identify stress and trauma in the people who we love and who we work with and help provide support for them. So in the, in the most basic sense, these mind-body medicine skills help us be more resilient in the face of climate change. Because you see, addressing these climate change issues is more than just reducing carbon emissions and creating clean energy solutions. Indeed, burning fossil fuels has been a key factor in the escalation of global warming, and there are key strategies we should implement to draw down and mitigate this. However, the root causes of the current damage to the earth are more complex. They're intersectional. They're multidimensional. And in addition to implementing clean energy solutions and reducing carbon, we also need to be addressing the beliefs, the behaviors, the historical injustices, the current injustices, and the lifestyle choices that led to and perpetuate the situation. We need to address the human suffering, the trauma, and the stress that are the result of the climate catastrophes. So in essence, we really need to address climate psychology or the psychology of climate change. And part of this is cultivating emotional resilience within ourselves, within our communities. And it also calls on us to engage in climate strategies and climate planning with a trauma-informed approach. This is super traumatic. This is hard to sit with. It's hard to just show up and breathe to. So being mindful of these things as we're going through this process is going to help us tremendously. So as we become more aware of the realities of the climate crisis, it's scary, right? It's, it's just overwhelming on some cases. It's hard to sit with the reality. It's easy to not want to talk about it. Um, it's difficult to psychologically process and emotionally cope with the climate catastrophes, the fires, the floods, the damaged ecosystems, species loss, physical loss, property loss. I mean, in essence, we're living during this sixth great extinction of plants and animals, and yet even really fully awake to the psychological suffering that's inextricably connected to all of this loss. So these climate crises that we're dealing with really present us with existential crises that impact our whole body. We're, we're whole beings, right? So biologically, psychologically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, we're impacted. And we need people to wake up and become aware and step in and get engaged now more than ever. Yet becoming aware is so impactful that it's difficult. It's extraordinarily stressful and can actually be anxiety producing, which is the conundrum that we're living in, right? When I think about the grief, just the grief alone is tremendous. And I, and I wanna point out that denial is a key protective factor of our grieving process. So when I hear people speak about climate deniers and, and there's a lot of animosity, I see it differently. I see people who are deeply grieving and aren't ready to accept the reality of what we're dealing with and that that's a process and something that we have to show up and be gentle to. So the current bodies right now the, in psychiatric and psychological communities are referring to what's going on as ecological grief. There's a couple of names like eco-grief, climate crises, climate anxiety, eco-anxiety. And although these things are not yet listed on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, what we call the DSM-5, an article recently published by Kaiser Health indicates that doctors and practitioners are seeing a dramatic increase in patients self-reporting climate distress. More and more people are speaking to the urgency of the climate crises. In fact, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences at the National Institutes of Health speak to this urgency in a webinar that they titled, The Urgent Need to Build Personal and Psychosocial Resilience for Climate Change. 
They indicated three necessary interrelated elements that will provide an effective response to climate disruption. And the first two I think are self-evident. We talk about them a lot. Reducing emissions from fossil fuels and protecting our natural carbon sinks. Preparing and adapting physical infrastructure and natural resources. But there's a third key component that I think is essential, and that's building the capacity of individual groups to cope with trauma, to be resilient, be able to learn together, to grow together and thrive together. These things are the essential things that are gonna help us navigate this time that we're in. The International Transformational Resilience Coalition is building human, human resilience on climate change, they urgently call on climate programs to expand and include a focus on building this personal and community resilience component. They urge mental health and public health programs to expand beyond treating people during and after disasters to being proactive and cultivating human resilience for trauma and toxic stress in all communities moving forward. We don't know where the next thing's gonna hit us. We didn't know that we would be impacted by a fire and then a flood within a year and a half of it. And, and what that would do to our community here. This um, International Transformation Resilience Coalition, they caution that if we leave these issues of psychology unaddressed, the harmful personal mental health and psycho actions to the climate change impacts will be as bad or worse than the physical impacts. That the maladaptive human reactions, so our behavior, will threaten to stall or completely scuttle any efforts to cut emissions, to adapt, to minimize the climate crisis. So if our climate plans aren't addressing climate psychology and resilience, we have, then they could be slowed down in being implemented and executed. We need this, this is essential. We have to be talking about these things. Um, furthermore, they're asking for us to do this in a preventative model. So setting up communities where these things are the norm, um, we've seen it here, the climate events, the 2017 wildfires, the 2019 atmospheric river that dumped a ton of water in our area, took out a tree that fell on my house. So I, I know this impact of what's going on with the climate quite personally. Um, the impacts of these things, the stressors of things have the potential to impact us, years, if not lifetimes within our communities. And these climate events are gonna continue. And they're gonna to continue to impact us, our emotions, our physical health, our social functioning, our food infrastructures, our overall well-being and the health of our community. If we don't address this, if this continues unresolved, this distress can damage our health and limit our potential for rebuilding the strong communities to be able to thrive. So it makes me wonder, you know, how do through this climate grief with a sense of emotional resilience. There's um, a MFT, a marriage and family therapist named Leslie Davenport. She's written a book called Emotional Resiliency in the Era of Climate Change. It's a clinician's guide, um, but within it, she has great suggestions. One, she encourages us to trust our grieving processes and the natural flow of our emotions. Grieving and structures that support grieving processes are not very um, well supported in our culture currently. Like a lot of times we just don't know how to grieve or we will hear people say time will heal that or let's get back to normal. But we have a whole new normal. We don't have the same normal to go back to, right? We have to be resilient and innovate a new thing and we have to process our grief. And we can only do that so far on our own. Like we really need our community. We need to be sitting in circles. We need to be sharing what's coming up for us and figuring out how do we support each other moving forward. I think this, at the heart of this, is really engaging things with a sense of curiosity and, and compassion for ourselves and for others. And then being aware of our somatic experiences. So constantly like checking in, okay, what's coming up for me around this feeling? What's mine? What's going on in the collective? Um, being aware of the body is very, very important. Bringing ourselves back to our breath, using breath as a, a key to controlling our autonomic nervous system and how we respond to things will help us even in the moment. 
Like as you were talking, Trayton, everything you said, I know that, but I was still having that same somatic reaction to tightening and holding and, oh my gosh, it's so much. How do I do this? And I have to remind myself, breathe, be here now. In this moment, I'm okay. And remind myself to center and come back to present. Because that key facet of our mindfulness is going to help us. It's going to help us shift our narrative around, like, is this the great apocalypse? Or is this what Joanna Macy calls the great turning? Like, how do we frame this thing we're in? There is all this urgency, right? But we get to control the narrative that we create around it and how we step in. So let's say we believe it's the end of times, right? That might lead to certain more nihilistic types of behaviors where people aren't engaging and problem solving. But if we believe this is the great transition, right? Then this is a time that is ripe and full of opportunity. And it it really makes me think about um, the word crisis. In Chinese, the word crisis is comprised of two characters, one that represents danger and the other that represents opportunity. So if we've never faced a, a more grave danger than what we're dealing now, it's true to say that we have this most amazing, fruitful opportunity that we can lean into as well. But it doesn't mean that we do it in a way that spiritually bypasses the grief or in some sort of like super pretty Pollyanna way, like everything's just going to be great because that's just not real, right? That's glo- glossing over it. And What we need to do is show up to the story, reframe the way we believe about the situation, and then get creative, right? The expressive arts or any type of creative expression, music, dancing, poetry, um, the things that inspire us, that bring joy back into our lives. We need these things now more than ever. And these things can be seen as medicinal in this way. Here locally in Sonoma County, we're We had, like you mentioned, the fire and the flood. But fortunately for us, we have the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative, which was spearheaded by Santa Rosa Community Health. And it was developed to address for community resilience. It's an evidence-based community resilience program. And it's a model that addresses the whole person and the impacts of stress and trauma on the whole person. And how to do this in a way within our community where we're building on those social determinants of health. So we know being together is going to help us reduce our feelings of isolationism. We're going to find camaraderie with people and we're going to have tighter connections. That's going to help us get through this. So this collaborative, it works in partnership across the community and with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, whose curriculum is the foundation for the program. Two cohorts have already been trained here in Sonoma County. It's a train-the-trainer type of model. So now there are over 200 people who are facilitating workshops and groups in the community where we're teaching mind-body medicine skills for resilience. This, In this way, the collaborative is developing our local capacity for healing, empowering everyday people with evidence-based self-care tools for effectively addressing what's going on personally, what's going on in our professions, how do we build strong social connections, because we know these are the predictors of community resilience and preventing the progression of stress and trauma into more serious social, mental, physical, and social impacts. This model would be beneficially embedded within all climate action strategies so that people have these skill sets while they're doing this work. We have this great model where we can talk about what's coming up and address it. Um, it it's been incredibly valuable for, for me. And Trayton and I have taken this to the team at Daily Acts where we facilitated um, eight, eight group sessions with the team where we went through and talked and explored uh, these concepts around medicine. So these have been really helpful for me in managing my stress around this, like like critical, can I say that? Because we all have our own stress response to what's going on and um, everybody's unique in how they deal with their stress. And for me, I went into kind of go mode, like that sense of urgency that we talk about in the world. 
yeah, I was working like 10, 12 hours a day. Let's do this. We've got to step in. And I wasn't taking care of myself in the way that I needed to. And these mind body medicine skills helped me better take care of myself. Like what you referenced, put the oxygen mask on yourself first on the airplane, right? So that I could take care of, I can slow down to better help hold space for what's going on in the community. So that I think is a really beneficial thing. I'd also kind of like to plug, since I have the floor, that in addition to cultivating this community resilience, climate action strategies would greatly benefit from implementing a trauma-informed approach. This would enable community leaders to, to recognize the signs and the symptoms of direct and indirect trauma for themselves, their families, their peers, the community at large. And a trauma-informed approach would respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into the policies, the procedures, and the practices, and would do so in a way that actively reduces re-traumatization. That's really, really important. Because these impacts of the climate crises are complex. They're intersectional, they're multidimensional, and in response, our climate action strategies need to be holistic, equitable, inclusive, and trauma-informed. We really do need to understand the dynamics of, of climate psychology, the impacts of eco ecological grief, and then help to create and co-create systems that cultivate our resilience. Um, thank you. Nice. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, you're welcome. Wow. I, I want to just say um, something that's come up for me a bit. Um, just especially in the last couple of years. Okay, so here's a situation that I think a lot of folks might actually be in. Uh, so the situation is urgent. We need to make lifestyle changes. We need to rise up in our communities. Um, there's a whole bunch of actions we can take, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And in a lot of in a lot of ways. There's social movements that need to be built and grown and people getting in the streets and transforming our society as a whole. Now, one of the challenges that I personally face is that I have a, a, a nervous system disorder um, that ha has really become an obstacle for me to be able to go out there and get out in their community, get out in the streets, go to meetings, participate in a bunch of community actions. And part of, the, part of what comes up for me with that is you know, a, a feeling of failure, right? Like it's so urgent, but I can't go do those things. I physically just can't do it because I'm, and, and I think that one way that we're isolating people, that people are feeling isolated and it ties right into the grief is like the, the, the scenario is so huge. And what we're calling for, for urgent action is often pushes people to their edges. And there's a lot of folks that just can't take the time or they don't have the physical ability to get out there. And, and I think that this is something that we have to address because if we want to, if we, if we want to grow and evolve as a society that can honor nature and honor each other and make the lifestyle and community choices that align with the ecological constraints and regenerative needs of our communities, um, we've got to do it in a way that everyone can be involved and it's not only the youth who have the energy and it's not only the people who have the physical capabilities. And so I really love just what you've brought to the table to, because I feel like there's people like myself that um, like, I'm embarrassed, you know, to say that I can't go do this or that because of my physical obstacle. Um, but I know that there's so many folks that are like sitting here, they're watching this or they're, or they're, you know, hanging back, feeling the grief at home, not knowing what to do, not feeling like they can get out there. And kind of one thing that I hope we can address, and we're going to get into the solutions and joining the movement, everything here soon, is um, you know, how how can we bring the whole community? You know, how can we embrace everybody in all of our diversity, our neurodiversity, our um, you know, folks with disabilities, people who have to work three jobs you know, to take care of their families. They don't have time to go out into the streets. They need to put food on the table, but they are as entrenched and as impacted by the climate crisis as anyone else. Um, and so I feel like these are some of the issues that I just like want to ask the community, um, ask of all of us to consider 
um, how we bring a wider spectrum of our of our community along. How do we message the work in such a way that folks can find different ways to plug in, different avenues, different angles, um, where we can feel like we're a part of making an impact, even though some of us may have some real obstacles. And that's kind of for both of you to take on and chew on, and for us to um, to chew on as we go through the rest of the webinar here. I. I think the biggest thing that came up when Eric, you and I talked about that the other day is I was so grateful that you were willing to be courageous enough to share about that because otherwise, you know, that's a part of speaking the climate truth as well of what is your healthy stretch versus like, hey, I actually can't do this or I can't do this. Like, okay, sweet. How do we make this work for everyone? Like you're saying, and the only way we find out is if people are sharing, Um, you know, on the mind-body medicine front that Nicole is leading on, I, I personally have practices for close to the last 20 years that I've been focused on to be able to sustain in the work. And I'm my practices are getting tested heavily, even more so than in the fires in a lot of ways in the last six months to a year. Um, and then, like Nicole said, we've been practicing these things organizationally for quite a while but then we recently went through the mind body medicine training and are actually on the steering committee for the community resilience collaborative. And so sitting in circle with our staff every other week for four months, essentially was incredibly helpful. Um, and we, we do this in other coalitions and spaces, which to the point of speaking the courageous truth, I literally just had a conversation today with an amazing activist who informed me that, at one point in holding a circle, we didn't do a sufficient check-in to make sure it was trauma-informed, and it was really difficult for that person to participate. And so I was super thankful that they actually shared that, because that's the only way things happen and get better. Um, there's an edge sometimes on bringing these practices in, and like Nicole said, how do we make sure we're doing it in a trauma-informed way? So I think the biggest thing of, like, they're speaking climate truth but hearing your own truth, what are your struggles? What are your needs? And speaking that as we're called to step forward so we can figure out to make sure that we make the movement inspiring and bold and create enough for everybody to fit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one other thing I just wanted to add is that we also have a massive global refugee crisis and I have um, uh, people that are close to me that are, trying to get back, trying to get across the border, across the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and where the realities of that are devastating. And so I think like part of what we're talking about too is, is also like, how do we hold space for folks that are coming through really traumatized and folks who are in the streets, um, you know, activating on a civil disobedience level. That's another way that folks could get traumatized and burn out. So yeah, holding space on all these different levels, these tools about how we build and support community and, and create space to talk about it, you know, first and foremost, um, it's, this is a this is like a mature level now of how, where we need to go with the with all movements um, in a way where we can really handle uh, what's coming down right now. I was and here Nicole is to China, but just literally last night I was I was with a friend who's the new sustainability coordinator for the town of Windsor, and he's bringing the emergency resolution forward for the town. And I was talking, I'm like, Paul, we need to make sure that it's not just, just like Nicole was saying, it's not just the energy retrofits and the drawdown, the sequestration, that we have these mind-body medicine practices. Because as people are waking up, we have to help them make sense and stay sane and whole and be effective. So I, we, do, we do need it in the plans. And I didn't know if you had any, anything in comment to Eric's comments, Nicole, before I move to the next section. Well, I think what came up for me around what you said, Eric, was the need for self-care and to just honor where we're at because we all go through fluxes and, and changes within our abilities. Some people have um, different, we're, we're all differently abled in that way. And so the most important thing that we can do is know our capacity, what we can and can't do, where our strengths are, how do we support our strengths? Where do we need extra support? Those things are so valuable. And I'm just reminded of how impactful it is to, to just show up, to embrace the grief. I think about something Carl Jung said, um, embrace your grief for there your soul will grow. And we're in times where, like you said, we're growing existentially, tremendously at this point in time. 
And it makes sense that that would also include space to grieve and to be with what is really difficult. It is really difficult to know that there are children and people being detained as they're trying to come across here. And some of these are climate refugees who are seeking help. That could be us in the near future, we don't know. So being able to hold compassion for ourselves and compassion for the whole at the same time is complex. Grief is messy, right? Nobody's dear, it was this linear process, you know, where we go through these stages and then hurrah, we're done. It's not really like that. It's messy, it's like life, it's cyclical, it's layered, it, it spirals, right? And we, we keep showing up and we keep moving to it with heart with curiosity, with love. I just have to say too, you know, my heart has broken a lot in the last 18 or more years since before I started Daily Acts and that whole Joanna Macy lens of the the heart that breaks open many times is big enough to contain the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've been really surprised in the last year of like thinking like I've done most of my heartbreak and I'm on to making the better world, right? Like I got the solutions game on full time, all time. And, and letting in the like extra level of the climate reality, like I've grieved and my heart has broken in ways that like, I think are greater than it ever has. And especially when I'm already looking at it, but I meditate every day. I know my purpose, my vision. I have all this great community. I have so many practices. And so that one, you know, it's, it's been difficult, but I also, my values have shifted and deepened. I'm, I feel more morally clear and just more who I'm meant to be. Um, and yeah, just clear on what I, who I need to be in the world and what I need to do. Um, and it also, again, makes me even value more the work that you and others do, Nicole, of, cause like, God, if I've been struggling with it this much and I have all these great practices and we're doing this work and this incredible community around me and that, and it's still this hard, like we really have to bring this piece in. Um, and, you know, just you'd mentioned differently abled. I just want to briefly come back as we switch into. So what are some of these different solutions going on? You know that, again, a year ago this month, a 15-year-old girl started cutting class and launched this global movement. And, you know, we often think of things like autism as a disability. And yet, you know, in articles I've read, Greta sources her autism being on the spectrum as the source of her power, not something she overcame. Like it's the source of her power and her fierceness. And so I just think it's so amazing that the voice and face of power, um, as far as I know, and she's been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize now, is a young woman with a quote unquote disability. And she's just like, she's just this face of the global movement. She's on rock star albums and stuff now. And she doesn't care about it, but you know, it's just uh, flipping the script on those sort of things of like youth, female, um, being on the spectrum, like immense, immense power, 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 power. And so um, I, I look forward to more of that. People bringing forward the things that they may feel uncomfortable with or feel like are, are not their gifts, are their, their challenges. Um, that, that becomes our courage and our power to speak from and the source of our strength, you know? Um, so in that regard, just to touch back to, you know, so you could go onto the website, Eric had it up early of fridaysforfuture.org. They're helping organize these global youth strikes. And you can see Greta right there on the cover. Um, you know, 350.org is doing an amazing job the last decade plus, uh, inspiring a global movement to stop fossil fuels. They're involved in the strikes. In the U.S., part of the, that's Greta right there, in the U.S., part of the Sunrise Movement um, has been another youth movement that's pushing hard on the Green New Deal and, and partnering with another unexpected, amazing new source of power, a bartender, young woman of color that suddenly is in Congress and raising positive hell, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, you know, moving the Green New Deal forward. So there's a lot of excite, exciting work happening at the national scale and really pushing the Democratic National Committee and the Democratic Party to take a stronger approach on bold climate leadership. Bernie Sanders just introduced a $16 trillion um, climate plan. And so a lot of this has come from grassroots push. This didn't just happen on its own. It's this global youth movement that is, has everything to lose and nothing to lose. And it's just speaking fiercely and courageously. And I think they can inspire and empower us all for They definitely have for me, um, the sunrise movement, which is a new in the last couple of years organization. I mentioned um, the, this global climate emergency resolution movement and that, you know, 
uh, last early last year, the climate mobilization movement had a few um, what you know a big part of their push is to get municipalities to declare a climate emergency, to pass a resolution. And that's a first step to shift the paradigm saying we need to go into emergency mobilization mode to rapidly um, draw down and reduce emissions. But a second piece is then we need to put the policies and plans in place to do that. And then after that, we need to start getting implemented. But really all those things need to happen at the same time. So that's their push. And they went from early last year uh, just a few climate emergency resolutions around the planet. And then I think this spring, when we started an effort that I'm going to tell you about in a second, they had maybe 400. And now they're at 970 climate emergency resolutions in 18 countries. Whole countries have done this. The city of London, I believe, has pledged net zero by 2030. Um, it's just blowing up around the planet. And it's really shifting that lens. It's speaking that bold climate truth and saying we need to mobilize on this sooner. And so inspired by a lot of this work and just feeling the urgency, um, you know, even ratching up, which is tricky, you know, like what Eric and Noel Cole were saying, because we've been doing grassroots organizing. This is our 18th year at Daily Axe. We've ran over 1,300 programs, we've been through fires, floods, droughts, big mobilizations. And so sustaining in that work, and just like after the fires, when there was this pulse and there was so much devastation, but then there was this unleashed power of community and we helped launch a number of different new coalitions um, and it feels to me we're really in one of those pulses where everything is getting shaken up and it's getting shaken up rapidly and it needs to. And I definitely couldn't sustain at this pace and definitely, and I'm trying to double down on my own practices, but I'm also really recognizing we're in a movement moment and we need to feed this because we have to, you know, to, what we need to do in the next decade, we have to start making the fundamental shift right now. And so out of that, um, some local community members, one of our volunteers, Annie Stewart, amazing volunteer at Daily Axe, and she helped start 350 Petaluma working on climate stuff. And she approached me early in the year and she's like, Trayton, we're, you know, we're wanting to pass a climate emergency resolution. Here's the background. Here's the things going on. Would you, you know, want to be involved? Do you have any thoughts or advice? And I met with her and started thinking about it and started looking and, you know, we had been ratcheting up our, our interest. We've been talking to our regional climate protection authority about launching a program with them, which became the Sonoma climate challenge, which we're involved in. And we recognize like, we need to jump in on this. It doesn't matter that we have a full plate from the fires and launching our environmental health program. And I'd be at our office right now, but we have 20 new leadership institute folks come in because we brought the leadership institute into daily access. We'd already launched a lot. And morally I knew we had to step up on climate and do something. And so we came together and a small group of activists, um, you know, local business owners, some justice focused activists, some environmental nonprofits is a really good mix of people. And we started this campaign, a Petaluma Climate Action Campaign. And we did this, you know, this is to me a different kind of advocacy that we need more of that Daily X is very much focused on. Um, you know, the stopping work of just being in the face, that has its place. That is certainly important, especially with stopping fossil fuels and things. But in my experience and working with our municipal agencies and partners for well over a decade and doing incredible work, it's like Eric and I, you know, a decade ago this year, um, Eric helped us install the first public food forest in Northern California, right across the street from my house in Petaluma. A few months later, on the first 350.org day of global climate action, we transformed the city hall landscape in a day with our municipal partners, saving a million gallons of water, a bunch of money. Um, and so we've been working in partnership with Eric and other people's leadership on things like that for a decade with the city and other cities in our water agency. And so we know they're a little slow to move sometimes that there's really incredible people who are on staff in these agencies and there's really incredible people who are in elected positions. And so a number of us were in conversation with our amazing mayor, um, you know, one of Daily Act's former staff, Delinda Fisher, has now got elected to city council. So we got a, you know, person who gets climate reality on the inside too. And we're looking, we have an amazing new city manager who's been a Daily Act supporter and is a total, you know, a, a get things done person, Peggy Flynn. And so like, wow, the new council, the climate issue, all this. Um, and so a number of us groups came together and we helped launch this campaign to really um, work with and support the city to uh, make equitable climate action the city's number one priority. And what we wanted them to do to do this is to one, declare a climate emergency resolution and two, establish a climate cabinet or a climate commission. 
And so we had about 400 people signed the petition, uh, about 50 businesses organizations signed on in the span of barely a month. And on the city's policy setting session day on April 6th, we had about 100 community members out there singing songs, leading with youth leading chants with the Sunrise Movement there. And, you know, the city council listened. We went inside and there was an all day planning session and it was really amazing. Every single council member, they heard our message. They saw who was there. They saw it was grassroots. They saw it was equity focused organizations. They saw it was small business. A diversity of our community came together um, and had been in conversation with staff and council and understanding their challenges, not just pointing a finger at them, but saying, look, we're, we're, here, we're here asking you for you to do this because this is a state of emergency on our planet. And this is what we're willing to step up with you. And so what was amazing is that the, the council and the staff responded beautifully. And within a month, they declared the first climate emergency resolution in Sonoma County. And then just last month, they changed the city's charter to create a climate action and policy commission, which if you're in Petaluma right now, you can go to the city's website, you can download an application and you could apply to be a, a climate commissioner for the city of Petaluma, four year appointed position. And, you know, so we did the big rally, but then we got to be right there. So we were, we've been right there each step of the way. Um, the campaign then became climate action Petaluma and we've been meeting every two weeks and, our diversity is also a challenge too at times. It's difficult growing organizations and coalitions and movements. It is, it is important and righteous work and it, you know, it's, it's messy. So it's good to be doing our meditation practice and checking our own egos and then just figuring out how to communicate, communicate well together. But it's been an amazing initiative. And so we continue to work with the city of Petaluma. We're hosting a climate action forum um, next Thursday, September 5th. And we're going to have a big equity breakout. Look at what does that mean? How, how, how do we do equitable climate action? We're going to talk about what does it mean to be civically engaged, to serve on a commission, and just educate people about climate. So if you're in the area, come out to the meeting um, and then apply. You know, we And the city agreed to do things differently as well in a more of a shared leadership way. They're, um, on September 19th, I believe, they're going to make a decision about who the commissioners are, uh, interview them in a whole public process. And so they're really, you know, we've seen when the community steps up and engages proactively with the city, they're excited to have our leadership and our partnership. And so it's been amazing. And out of that um, and other related efforts, now there's a movement spreading around the county to get all of our cities and our county to declare a climate emergency, which we believe that'll happen in the coming months. So we'll have every city and the county declare climate emergency. It also inspired our partner, the Regional Climate Protection Authority which is a government body working on climate to um, create their own resolution out of Petaluma's leadership. So there's a bunch of really exciting things happening. Um, and at the same time, you know, I have to say one thing, as much as the global truth and the news that comes in every day has been really hard for me to swallow something, this is shifting the thing I'm about to say, but something that's been even more difficult for me personally is because we live in a place of immense leadership. The partnerships we've had with the city, the stuff Eric and others are doing at Permaculture Skill Center, Oxland Arts and Ecology Center, the Mind Body Medicine, all aspects. We have so much leadership here in cutting edge innovation. We have carbon free water at our water agency. Um, Sonoma County is the second community in the state to create community choice aggregation, our own Sonoma Clean Power. So there's a lot that's working. And, and as I've really woken up and embraced the reality we're facing, I've, I've literally spoken with hundreds of leaders, leaders of organizations, coalitions, elected officials at all scales, heads of agencies. And the stealth climate denial has been kind of difficult. Most folks, again, just like I had previously too, sigh, acknowledge business as usual, even if it's a better version of it, even if it's solving the housing crisis, doing a good thing. And, and the reality to me and what I'm seeing and hearing everywhere is we have a lot of important issues they have to solve and those don't go away. And if we don't have a stable climate, there is no health, there is no equity, there is no economic prosperity, there is no solving the housing crisis. Um, and so we have to collectively bring, um, bring climate into the center with these other issues. And so that's been really difficult in recent months seeing like, I'm like, how, how are we not centering on this? But that's starting to shift. It's like every day there's more momentum. Um, we have, I've been meeting with our, our, coming, our county supervisors, our incoming board chair, Susan Gorin. She's going to be the chair of the board of supervisors next year. Her and Supervisor Linda Hopkins are fired up on climate leadership. We met with Senator McGuire last week, meeting with Grant Davis, the head of the water agency. 
all of a sudden it's starting to pop and shift and meeting with Latino leaders and it's, there's momentum. There's a, a Latino forum on health focused on climate change this fall. So suddenly there's like, okay, it's game on, which to Nicole's thing, it's kind of blowing up in all directions and there's a lot of need right now. Um, and there's a lot of things happening at all levels and you can't micromanage it. You can't be in it all, but a really important piece that we're seeing is there's all this grassroots happening. And then there's the work at the cities and the County and the different departments. And it's really important to try and thoughtfully coordinate how we're doing this. And when we're doing that, we're not just rushing to affect the change. And we look around and we're all white people and we're like, wow, do we have representation from communities of color? And are we getting their perspective in this? And have we been building relationships to do that? Is youth at the table? Um, and so it's that whole go slow to go fast thing. Um, so there's just an enormous amount of merging. The climate emergency resolutions are a really key piece. We're also working with the Regional Climate Protection Authority, which we partnered to launch the Sonoma Climate Challenge. You could go to sonomaclimatechallenge.org to register or take a peek at that. That's a place you could take personal action. And, and really, you know, they have great and bold ideas. And again, though, these government systems are complicated between staff and elected and community and where's everything at. And, and so really um, pushing and recognizing that we need our, there's not a plan anywhere on any table in the community of leadership that is Sonoma County that is anywhere near the climate science currently. No plan anywhere in this place of leadership. So that's the bottom line right now. We need to change that by putting public wind in the political sails, as Ann Hancock says from the Center for Climate Protection. Um, building public and political will, in my mind, is the number one thing we need to do. Bernie Sanders said, he's like, you could have all the plans you want, and unless people are in the streets or doing their version of that, if they can't be in the streets, then nothing's going to change. Um, Naomi Klein, 400 pages of her climate book, This Changes Everything. One of the most core insights, build public and political will. So we need to build the will, like that's what we did in Petaluma, but then we need to be right there saying, oh, okay, now what's next? All right, citizen-led climate body. Let's recruit all of our climate experts. Let's get Tori Estrada from the Carbon Cycle Institute, like a carbon cycle sequestering Jedi in Petaluma. Um, people like Eric when the commission happens in Sebastopol and working with the city and saying, hey, Peggy, you know, head of parks, can we do the first city scale carbon sequestration plan in the country? Yeah, they're interested. Like, awesome. Let's pull our people together. So there's building the public and political will and declaring the emergency. And then there's what are the policies and plans we need to have in place? and then started to implement. And so we're doing that in, with our partners in the city of Petaluma and also trying to work with the county and help these leaders think through, um, well, what does it look like to do sequestration targets where we draw down emissions at a county scale from rural ag ranch land to gardens to parks? Um, what does it look like to do full mitigation? One brief thing I wanna touch on is that most climate action plans in the country by municipalities, they only cover a portion of the emissions reduction. Uh, they don't talk about consumption-based emissions. Those are you know, the things you eat. If you have a heavy meat diet, they're flying. They're all the things we consume. If you're buying a bunch of new t-shirts all the time or whatever, and varying on where you're at, that's 30 to 50% of the emissions. And so a lot of our plans have really good stuff, but if we're missing 30 to 50% of the dashboard, um, and the thing is, you know, the planet, the physics of the planet doesn't care about what's politically comfortable or safe to talk about. So that's a piece that we're encouraging that we have a holistic plan that is full mitigation of our emissions. We need to do sequestration, rapidly draw down, put carbon in the soil, victory garden movement, right? 42% of our food is grown in victory gardens of World War II. We need the climate victory garden movement. Um, and so sequestration across all of our lands, and then we need some deep adaptation. So those are a few of the, and I'll pause for a moment because I get fired up on this stuff. But those are a few of the pieces that are moving um, and just trying to, you know, get resolutions moved forward. And we have a big public petition that you could sign. We're trying to get people and organizations to sign on, to help build that public will. And then understand the challenges of understaffed agencies. I talked to my friend last night, who's the new sustainability coordinator. That's more work. He has a bigger job now, you know? And so we need to understand the people who are trying to do this stuff and support them and understand the electives. And we kind of all, you know, we all have to pull our levers together is kind of our advocacy strategy of get, get key representatives from all parts of the system, whether it's nonprofit, government, business, um, 
communities of color, range of folks, youth, and, and think and act together so we could understand um, the scale of the challenge and how our wisdom fits together. Wow. Um, so much there, Trayton. And what I love is that as you started talking about drawdown, um, some folks over in Facebook Live were like, drawdown, read, read, drawdown, project drawdown. And it's like, oh, and you're, you're echoing that over here. Um, I think that uh, now everyone who's listening, if you have questions or comments, now would be a great time to get them in. You can ask Trayton, you can ask Nicole, you can ask myself. Um, we're here talking about embracing climate truth. We're here talking about rising for climate action. As you all get your questions in, we want to draw your attention to a really incredible event that Daily Axe is organizing right now. Trayton, you want to talk about the climate action concert that's coming up? Yeah, sure. Um, so next, in, on Sunday, September 8th in Rohnert Park, we're having Daily Acts Matter Rise Up for Climate Action. And we're going to have a thousand or more people there. We're going to have incredible bands. Rupa and the April Fishes is headlining. She's, they're amazing musicians, but they're also really incredible social justice activists. She's also speaking as well. Um, we're going to have Dusty Greenbone bands, the Real Sarahs, the Highway Poets, Coffus Brothers, some great music. At the same time, we're going to have Brock Dolman, world-renowned ecologist speaking. We're going to have a trash and show, fashion show. Um, there's going to be <laughs> county supervisor Linda Hopkins is going to speak, and she's going to share some exciting initiatives at the county scale, as well as an important call to action. She's a phenomenal speaker, and to see people in positions of power who fiercely get this and are wanting to step up. Um, we're going to have speakers from the Sunrise Movement. Edward Willie, amazing local indigenous permaculturist, is going to open things up for us, friend of mine and Eric's. And so there's all this happening on the stages. At the same time, we're going to have a climate action hub where you're going to be able to sign on to the climate emergency resolutions that pass them. You're going to be able to find out about the Sonoma Climate Challenge. You're going to be able to find out about state legislation. You're going to be able to drive an electric vehicle or check that out if you want to. Um, a bunch of stuff happening there. And then, Nicole, I don't know if you want to touch on the healing hub that we're going to have as well. Sure. We're going to have a healing arts space. Um, and in that space, we'll have Melissa Barnett is <clears throat> going to facilitate some yoga for trauma or have a, a place where people can drop in if they're having a experience around what they're learning and the space. We're also going to have Era of Care, which is with Julia Bostrova, and she will be holding space for people to be talking about the spiritual implications. She's an ordained minister. She helps hold space and has been doing so um, on a lot of different fronts throughout the nation. And then we're also going to have uh, licensed marriage and family therapist Shannon Rogue hold a climate grief activity for people and provide resources for those who might be interested in looking at some professional support around their, their eco grief and climate trauma. And she would have resources available for people there. Yeah, that and art, lots and lots of creative expression because ultimately when it comes down to it, and I, I keep kind of threading back to one of the questions you asked earlier, Eric, what can I do? What can I do if I able to step out? And I believe truly deeply believe that the answers that we're seeking right now are not outside of ourselves. They're within us. And it's our task to quiet our minds enough to listen to that inner wisdom and to animate it, to activate it, to create it. And that that happens when we tap into our creative capacity. So when we're engaging creatively, when we're innovating, when we're giving ourselves that permission to be our most authentic selves, I think that's when we're going to see the solutions that we so desperately need being animated in the world. And so for everybody on this call and spread the word to your friends as well, invite people. This is, you know, there's all these, it's, it's about how we layer together these movement moments, right? Like we rallied a lot of people and we worked their city and that was a moment. And now we're, they're doing the climate commission. We're doing a big forum and we're going to get a lot of people to engage. And that's a moment. Um, the concert is a really big moment. A few days after that, there's a big board of supervisors meeting um, that is happening where their emergency resolution is going to be passed, hopefully. That's a big moment. I'll touch on in a minute the climate strikes on the 20th. 
And so it's about showing up for and having these things start to build momentum until we create a cultural tipping point. And this just becomes the game on societal project that we're all engaged in. Um, and so to support that, we're gonna, you could go to anybody here and you know, spread the word to your friends about getting tickets. Our goal is to sell 500 tickets by tomorrow. We have about 100 tickets to sell and then 1,000 by next Friday um, and then moving into the concert. And so anybody who buys tickets off of this webinar, you could go to our website, dailyacts.org, and you type in the code dailyactor, lowercase D-A-I-L-Y-A-C-T-O-R, and that will give you a $10 discount, whether it's on an adult ticket or a young person ticket, and kids 12 and under are free. So um, love to see you there. Um, love to have you spread the word as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm putting the links to get tickets into the chats, both here on the Zoom webinar and in the Facebook Live. So there's a link right there if you guys, if you all want to sign up. Now, I know that we have a more, a, a more national and potentially international audience here. So if you're not in Northern California, you can't make it. No worries, because the, the, this is a model for how we can bring together both uh, stepping up together for action, inspiring each other, holding space for the grief that we feel, and finding different ways for just us to 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 you know to work together and find solutions. And so, having these kinds of events where where a fam you know family friendly, um, there's music, there's action, there's organizing. It's like there's good food, there's vendors. Um, you know, sort of like everything is here to to meet everyone's different needs, to, like depending on where you're at. Uh, and, you know, and I wanted to mention just briefly, uh, Trayton was talking about some of the some of the work we've done in the past, like with the Kavanaugh Center, the public food forest gardens and such. And, as, and sometimes I think we, we ask ourselves, uh, is it enough to 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 just focus on my own lifestyles is it enough to build my garden and um and there's decisions we make every single day um, that we can make on the land. For those of you that are in permaculture or gardening or have, have any connection with the land, um, we make decisions about how we manage our ecology. And one of the prime ways to sequester carbon and build soil and grow food and, and one of our prime solutions is to build food security right where we're at, to develop water infiltration systems right where we're at. Um, the work of Walter Jenny, maybe I'll put a link in here a little bit later, Water for Climate, um, and the new science is coming out about how we can actually cool the earth um, through managing water in an ecological way. So there's just so many different ways, and I, I like to lean on those ways because of my, my physical ability um, allow, doesn't allow me to get out there into the meetings, into the streets as much, but I can get out onto the land. I can, I can manage the ecosystems around me. And I feel like events like the Daily Acts Matters event, um, I want to talk to people about how do we, how do we have a tree planting campaign? I mean, every one of our communities should be engaging in tree planting every single year as a community active effort. Um, and this is something that I'm really turned on about. Everyone can do it. Children can do it. Elderly can do it. We can do it together in community. And it's a powerful tool um, to, to adapt and mitigate to the climate crisis. So I hope to see um, those of you who can make it to this concert. I hope to see you there, to talk with you, to inspire each other, to hold space for each other. And um, this is just the beginning. You know, we're, we're building momentum um, to the tipping point that's required. Yeah. And if you do, you know, if you're in Sonoma County, the strikes, the global climate strikes are happening on Friday, September 20th from 12 to 2. There's a rally in Courthouse Square in Santa Rosa. Um, if you do, if you're not here, there's going to be, um, strikes all over the planet. You could go to like 350.org or Fridays for future.org. Those are a couple spots you could go to. And, you know, for the outside of the striking piece, like what you said, things that people can do, you know, we mentioned all the stuff you could do in Sonoma County, but again, for everybody, wherever you are, get more educated about what's going on with the climate and what's the piece that resonates with you or breaks your heart in a certain way and talk with it about others, talk with it with friend, family and friends. Um, you know, just get educated and talk every day. Ending climate silence is a really big thing. 
And also, you know, like Nicole really touched on practicing self-care and, and deal with our grief as we embrace these realities. And just, you know, Gandhi said, I'm so busy today, I'm going to meditate twice as long. So how do we up our self-care practices? Uh, personal actions you could take, you know, there's a lot of things you get here, but some of the big ones are eating less meat, um, flying less or not flying, kids and driving. Those are the big four that people don't want to talk about, right? Meat, flying, kids and driving. <clears throat> the one thing I will say on the meat is that a plant-based diet and drawdown is the number four solution, but silvopaster and regenerative ranching are top 20 solutions as well. And we did an event recently. Um, I absolutely appreciate people who go vegan and vegetarian and do that in a way that is organic and supports local ag and things, um, assuming you can afford to, because this is also an equity issue too, an equity conversation to be mindful of. But you know, our friends at Freestone Ranch, they're ranchers and they're the first ranch in Sonoma County to have a carbon farm plan. And they're actually carbon beneficial, the meat that they run. And where they started, they didn't want to raise cattle. They wanted to regenerate the ecosystem. And as they got educated, they learned that they needed to move animals on the land to protect and regenerate the ecosystem. And, and this is deep up into Eric's territory. But so so yes, I think we all collectively need to eat less meat. And my opinion is that we also need to support ranches and farms in transitioning because at least in Sonoma County, having ranches and farms actually protects our landscapes as well from development. So there's other benefits. It's a, you know, these are more nuanced conversations, but I, we could all still eat a lot less meat because most of it's not regenerative raised right now, <laughs> probably. Um, so there's the personal actions you take. And then the last piece is just getting civically engaged in a way that works for you. Join the uh, climate emergency resilient uh, resolution movement, do the strikes, start going to city council meetings. If everyone has went to city council meetings, even if we didn't have any knowledge and we just said, you know what? I am concerned about the climate crisis. Please do something. You don't have to have special skills, knowledge, or whatever. And also say, and I've never been to a city council meeting before, if that's the truth for you. That is a powerful addition. Um, volunteering for local groups, working on this stuff, and getting engaged in the national movement so we can get some sane political leadership that will boldly lead on climate. Um, so those are a few buckets of getting educated, talking, practicing self-care, uh, take an action yourself and getting civically engaged. Wonderful. Um, so uh, folks, as we're, we've got a few minutes left, we're going to be wrapping things up. Um, there's a few comments here. Andy says planting together is the best. Yeah. Um, Sharon said, uh, Sharon Carson says, I offer people to come here to garden uh, for nothing. It's easy to be on the line. Another whole deal to come here and sweat. Uh, and isn't that the truth? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, just shout out to all the land-based people, the farmers, Absolutely. the ranchers, the gardeners, the landscapers who have that ecological bent and uh, and are doing this good work. Um, Trayton, do you want to just mention, uh, so again, folks, if you have any last questions, now is the time to get your question in as we, as we wrap things up. Of course, um, come on out to the climate event, um, to the... Um, uh, Daily Acts Matter Climate Action Concert happening September 8th. Uh, we left, we put the, the link there in the tickets. Um, we've got, uh, Aura says, I urge your, your event to invite Michael Horn from the Fly blog. I know him personally. I'll try to make it happen. Just let me know. That'd be great. Thank you. Link in there for us to, to check out there. Um, and, you know, I know that we're doing, you know, we, we have to do what we can where we can. And the more that we can reach out and build connections and build relationships with each other and support each other in all the ways that we can, you know, we can make a big difference. And I just want to point out the work of Daily Acts um, here, 18 years of leading the way of modeling um, how to get stuff done. Um, and while we've been talking about climate and embracing the climate truth and rising actions, we also, you know, we're the, that's the backdrop in some ways, the context for so many different actions we can take. And if it's sheet mulching your lawn and putting in a food forest, if it's putting in a gray water system and keeping all your water on site, I mean, these are small yet powerful actions. And if you want to learn about these things, I highly suggest you go to dailyacts.org, um, check out you know, what they've done, uh, 63,153 people educated and engaged, 1,338 programs run, 
321,342 square feet of lawn gone. That's in- insane. I wonder what the number relationship of water savings is to that. I mean, we're probably talking millions and millions of gallons of water saved, right? Yeah, absolutely. And tens of millions of gallons through municipal programs that we've sort of inspired and helped launch, like in the city of Petaluma, that's saved well over, saves over well over 20 million gallons of water a year if you launch sheet mulched. So some of the solutions can be simple. They can be powerful. They're right in your hands or right in your backyard. And we just need to open our eyes, you know, widen the aperture, what, you know, have those owl eyes on to be able to see, you know, what little things, little changes we can make, big changes we can make to, to get involved. Um, as we uh, move our, on our way out here, um, Nicole, do you, do you have anything else you want to share uh, relative to the conversation as we um, as we close up? Um, yeah, actually, I think both of you touched on it, but I wanted to just reinforce it. In cultivating our relationships that help build resilience, cultivating our relationship with the earth is so vitally important. Being able to get outdoors and be active or just being in natural settings rather activates the parasympathetic nervous system, that relaxation response we talked about. So when we're talking about just at a very basic level, when things get so stressed, find a nice quiet sit spot in nature, connect to yourself, connect with the planet, with the life force around us. And when you're ready, come back and engage with community because we need you. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, Trayton, what do you want to leave us with? Um, just gratitude, you know, for, we just live in this big planetary moment and it keeps on getting bigger and the, you know, spending time with people like you and Nicole and Leslie Lee who's on and others looking at some of the names of just incredible people who are just taking heart and taking action and taking part every day of the week. Um, and you know, some people like author Meg Wheatley, famous, uh, leadership author of is, is more in the create islands of sanity mode. There's definitely a lot of people who think it's, you know, potentially too late. Um, but I seeing like such shift around me and I wholeheartedly believe that we can and needed to do everything we can to rise up to this moment. And we have solutions like the stuff that Eric and all the permaculturists around the planet are doing, you know, yeah, I just believe in the power of community and the power of nature-based solutions and the power of our collective daily actions to really rise to this moment. This is going to be the most transformative decade ever for humanity. And, you know, so kind of strapping into the self-care practice. I spend time in my garden every day. That's what keeps me sane. So definitely the land-based. Um, yeah, just power partnerships and and get get involved with us, get involved with groups like Daily Acts or, and other places, you know, stay on with Eric. and just figure out how to rise to this big moment together. Beautiful. Um, thanks everyone so much for tuning in with this has been recorded. So we'll be sharing the recording out there, um, sending that out to the list. If, if you found some inspiration, you found um, some gems, of actions you can take, you got inspired, you felt held in your grief, Um, please share this with your community and let's get as many people into this conversation as possible. Um, And come on out, if you're in Northern California, again, come on out to the Climate Action Concert happening September 8th, Daily Action Matters. I've put the link to the buying, to getting tickets. You can get um, 10% off, is that right? 10% off? $10 off. $10 off um, a ticket if you go to the link that we've shared here. Um, so please um, come join us at the concert, get get connected in your community. Um, gratitude to, to, to be in this in this work and in this circle um, with you all. Oh, and Andy's at, when, when will this happen again? Um, uh, oh, Andy, you mean the uh, the webinar or the concert, I wonder. Um, where uh, Trayton and I have discussed uh, po- possibly doing a series of live live events like this as we get into the climate strike and the climate forums and some of the other big um, big things that are happening in the, in the next month or so so um, so stay tuned uh, for next level conversations um, about the, the work we can do to, to heal our land and our community um, I think there may have been um, 
uh, just a couple more things here. Oh, Jesse says, I'm sending an announcement to my mailing list. May I, may I share the daily actor discount code? Sure. Go for it, Jesse. Um, Johan says, Trish and I are inheriting a simple subdivision house in Santa Rosa. The site is a wasteland of no plants of lots of Roundup. We want to transform it into a model feast garden a la permaculture and document and share how it is done. Can we ally with Daily Axe and with the Permaculture Skill Center? Of, co yeah. I mean, of course, we're yeah. always down to ally with you. Yeah. Johan's rocking it too. So <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, there's so many wonderful folks on the call right now, both in the zoom and on the Facebook. Like if you're just, if you're on right now and you just look at the names of folks who've, who've joined us, um, there's people all over the planet who are, who are on the front lines of this work, um, tuning in, connect with each other, talk to each other, hold space for each other as we work through these difficult times and, um, hope to see you at the concert. Um, um, and, uh, and I think that's it. We're going to, we're going to end it here. Um, stay tuned for a, another one of these in the coming weeks and, um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Trayton. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.